I don't think I ever became competitive, actually, until I was 88. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I got first right. place in what they call the uh, single age running. I'm 22 years older than the average person who dies in this country, and it's been a pleasure. For my age, I'm practically number one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, my podcast, the show where we go deep on a really wide variety of stuff, stuff that I think matters, including health, fitness, nutrition, what else, longevity, what it means to pursue a life of meaning, which are all subjects we're privileged to explore today through the lived experience of a centenarian, a human who has literally been walking the earth for a full 100 years, which is, of course, rare. It's really unique and just an amazing privilege to be able to talk to him today. His name is Mike Fremont. Mike is a retired engineer turned climate activist and athlete who, in addition to being pretty darn with it, holds, prepare yourself, get this, just an absolute slew of age group world records in running, including the fastest recorded marathon for an 88-year-old, for a 90-year-old and a 91-year-old, if I got that right. At the ripe young age of 96, Mike set the American one-mile record for the 95 to 99 age group. And as a lifelong canoe racer, at 99, he was the oldest person to race the Canoe National Championships. And Mike's still out there every single day, just getting after it. So how does he do it? What is Mike's secret? Well, this conversation is my attempt to extract his testimony and his counsel for younger generations on what he's learned about life, what he's learned about longevity, vitality, purpose, fitness, setting world records, and and diet. Because for Mike, it's kind of all about diet, specifically the whole food plant-based diet that he adopted 30 years ago something he did in the wake of receiving a colon cancer diagnosis that he really credits as fueling his training. It's what keeps him spry. It's what informs his climate activism. And in his words, really is the thing that has allowed him to thrive decades beyond social expectations. It's not often you get the opportunity to spend time with a centenarian. And I really think our culture fails pretty miserably when it comes to appreciating our elders. So I really loved having him on the show. Shout out to Mike's running buddy, elite ultra marathoner and friend of the podcast, Harvey Lewis, for making this podcast happen. I consider Mike a brand new friend, and I'm just really proud to share his voice with all of you today. So please hit that subscribe button and uh, let's do it. This is me and Mike Fremont. Well, Mike, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's an honor to talk to you today. It's a a, a rare thing that uh, anybody gets to sit down with somebody who has experienced so much life as you. And uh, I, I, I just can't wait to hear more about your life. I guess the first obvious question is, how does it, how are you doing? Like, how do you, how do you feel? What is it like to be a hundred? These, believe it or not, are the very best years of my life. Mm. No question. Why is that? Things that I've worked for and worked on have blossomed out. I'm still here. I can still run, so to speak. For my age, I'm practically number one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by, by sheer uh, process of elimination. But also, I mean, it's amazing that you still get out there. You're still running. You're so engaged with life. And um, I, I have to imagine that's a big part of the secret, just being engaged with life and, and finding purpose in the things that interest you. Uh, Well, it turned out that I made a wise decision when I was faced with an operation. And I hold that largely responsible for all the records that I set in old age. No question in my mind, absolutely it is diet that has determined my existence 
my continued existence, and my beautiful health. Mm. So tell me more about that. You were 70 when you were diagnosed with yeah, colon 69, cancer, 69. Actually. So yeah, maybe explain that a little bit. Uh, yeah, I had a polyp, P-O-L-Y-P, uh, in one of my nether parts. And the uh, doctor I went to sent me to the Cleveland Clinic for a proper diagnosis. And they put a television set uh, connection into me and so I could see what was going on. And they said that this uh, tumor that they saw had metastasized, which means it had taken root in different parts of my body, the lymphatic system, and that even if they took the tumor out, they would have to go after those metastases. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I had, uh, by that time, received a book from my son in California that I'll see probably tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Who had sent me a book called The Cancer Prevention Diet by Michio Kushi, a Japanese chap who settled here and was in Beckett, Massachusetts with his uh, entourage. And uh, I called him to ask him why he sent me the book. He said, you may need it someday. Uh -huh. So of course I didn't read it <laughs> <laughs> until I was diagnosed, at which point I devoured it and uh, I went cold turkey on what is now known as a vegan diet. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was a macrobiotic diet. I think it was even beginning to be accepted a little bit by people in California. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, <laughs> so essentially, for the last thirty years, you've been eating a, a very strict whole food. One hundred percent. A hundred percent. No exceptions. Cold turkey. And what happened to so? Cold, you get the diagnosis. Excuse me from the Cleveland Clinic. Did they want to uh, put you in chemotherapy or did you do chemotherapy they or said, what happened? Uh, they said, if you're not operated on, you have three months to live. Mm. That was the other side of the equation, I thought. So I decided, uh, after reading the book, I decided I would try the diet. And I said, I'll check with you guys from time to time which I didn't do because I, two weeks after going on the diet, I realized that various things were happening to me that I hadn't anticipated, such as uh, arthritis in the back of my neck, arthritis in the shoulder, arthritis in these fingers, had disappeared. Mm. No explanation, no problem. Furthermore, my hands and lips used to be chapped from the time I was a little kid. That disappeared. Wow. It disappeared. The only thing I might have had, which by that time I was uh, old enough to have outgrown, was asthma, which is what kept me out of the military, which kept me out of school for a month once. Mm. Was this for, so you were, you were born, I, I, I assume you were born in like 1922. Exactly. Right? So yeah. you would have been prime candidate for World War II. Exactly. Yeah. So half of my class was in uniform at college. Right. In uniform. And they had, they had their uh, educational uh, experience there too. And I regretted I couldn't be part of them. Mm. Anyway, that diet has so much going for it. I, I marvel that uh, big business hasn't grabbed it and run with it after all these years. Mm. People used to look at me strangely when I say, no, I don't, I don't eat meat. No, I don't drink milk. 
No eggs, no eggs. <laughs> yeah. Well, it has, I mean, there is big business now in that it is much more widely acceptable and adopted. It, it and is. there are lots of companies making products for this lifestyle, but you are correct. And it is interesting. So, so your, your arthritis started to disappear. You knew something was going on inside you, but did you have a sense that this was helping with your cancer? Uh, I'm no doctor and I'm, I can't uh, get into that science, but uh, these, several of these diseases that we have are truly associated with eating certain meats and um, what other categories there are. But you had, so you had, you had adopted this diet and you were eating this way for a couple of years. And then at some point you had the tumor surgically removed. It began though, right? to bleed again. Yeah. I knew I had to be operated for the basic tumor. I was operated by a doctor in Dayton who'd been in the army. He'd been an army doctor who specialized in that kind of operation. And he told Marilyn after the operation that he'd looked in 35 places for metastasis and found none, none, mm. 35 places. So what I had done by simply changing diet was to kill the metastases that would possibly have killed me. Mm. I found out subsequently, quite a bit subsequently, as a matter of fact, a matter of months ago, that there are something like 52,000 people a year who die of colorectal cancer. 90% of them die of the metastases. Mm -hmm. 90%. Yeah, that's amazing. And it and it never after you had the tumor removed, there was no you were in remission and it never came back. Well, I feel that I can counsel, actually counsel people who have this particular disease. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and say, yeah, try yeah. this, try this. Right. <laughs> right. And uh and and where does the running begin? Running, um, uh, I was 36, I had three little children and my first wife, and she died of a brain hemorrhage mm. when our daughter was two weeks old. And I was, uh, I had started a, a business a year before and I was all alone and uh, decided I was stressed and I lived on a dam, and I used to run across that dam, which was level, uh, right. uh, every day after work. And it was very rewarding. It was better than two martinis. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but not to be competitive at that time. No thought of it. Right. Then someone said, why don't you get in a race? And I said, uh -huh me uh, like I'm uh, 50 years old <laughs> 36 years old it was but I kept running I enjoyed it <clears throat> I used to go to the beach <clears throat> whenever we went to the beach which is not in Cincinnati of course right so running was became a little part of my life and then they got me in a race and I did okay. I didn't come in last. Uh -huh. <laughs> then said, well, were you gonna try for Boston? I said, I have to run a marathon first. <laughs> so I ran a marathon and didn't qualify for Boston. Uh -huh. So I ran a few more marathons and I qualified. Then I did my first Boston and I thought, wow, you can actually run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's it's around 60 where you start getting competitive though, as I understand, is that correct? Not really. I don't think I ever became competitive actually until I was 88. Uh-huh. 
I ran a marathon when I was 88, and I got first, right. first place in history in what they call the um, world single age running mm -hmm. category. I brought you some sheets of that to show you sure. if you hadn't seen them. Yeah, so so at 88, you set the single age world record for the marathon. And then at 90, you do it again, the single age world record for the marathon. Uh, and at 90, you also set the single age world record for the half marathon. And at 91, the single age world record for the half marathon. That's right. So you have one, two, four world records, and you have a whole slew of five-year age group records going. Yeah. It's, there's too many to even keep track. I didn't track, even so. realize that <laughs> at the time. Uh huh. There's not much competition out there. There hasn't <laughs> been because people don't understand the system, how, how your system works and contributes to your being able to do these things. So talk about that. I wanna hear more about how to how to do this thing so maybe explain how you do it like how are you how are you able to not just run marathons and half marathons in your late 80s and over the course of your 90s but also set world records like what is the secret to longevity here we talked about diet but also what is your fitness routine the longevity part of it is the interesting part i think and the uh, Japanese are credited with uh, living six years longer on average than Americans. That's a huge amount. Yeah. But here I've already, uh, I'm 22 years older than the average person who dies in this country. Right. And it's been a pleasure. And it's simply, simply because of what I eat, which is not that specifically precision designed to make me an expert. I'm not an expert on it. I know what works for me. And I've never had any question about it, but I just don't do bad things mm -hmm. in eating. Mm -hmm. Uh, what it tell me exactly what it is that you eat like a day in the life of food for you like what are your meals? Well, tomorrow or today, <laughs> I had some oatmeal <laughs> uh -huh. that had a few blueberries <laughs> in the top of it, and then some sweet glop or syrup or something—a little, little teeny thing—and <laughs> I had a cup. There was about this high, filled with fruits, for actually with berries, strawberries and and uh, blackberries and blueberries, and uh, one other thing might have been a piece of mango or something. Mm -hmm. I think it was seven dollars at the motel, which is a very high price. Of course. <laughs> Welcome to Los Angeles. <laughs> Wouldn't be high price if it was alcohol. Yeah. But <laughs> and what would a what would a lunch and a dinner look like for you? Oh, I might have something as prosaic as a half a can of uh, black beans or kidney beans or uh, garbanzo beans with a little bit of uh, tamari salty tamari. sauce, mm -hmm. just a few drops of it. And then I'll put the other half away in the ice box and eat it the next day. Right. So I try to get beans every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I might do uh, some broccoli uh, flowers, which I use a little bit of catsup with. Mm-hmm. To make them taste like something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So pretty, pretty basic, uh, close to their natural state 
Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. So what about the fitness routine? What is the secret to how you've been able to continue running into your 90s and now at 100? I was able to retire at the age of 88. (laughs) So low stress, free time? Stress also kills. And if you can keep your life from distress as well as stress, Mm -hmm. you're very fortunate. But diet and stress are the two things that can kill, definitely can kill. But s- s- tell me tell me about your, your daily fitness routine and how you've been able to stay active and, and running. Like, how do you keep it up? Well, actually, I, I run in a place called Sharon Woods, which is a uh, county park uh, five and a half miles from where I live. And it has hills, and it has a uh, gravel path, and it has a uh, blacktop path all together. And one circle is five miles. Mm-hmm. And the same people come out there year after year all the time. You expect to see them, you make friends of them. And I do that. My routine had been three times a week, Monday, not Monday, uh, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, I would run 10 miles Mm. until I was 98. Yeah, wow. I just said it was taking too long for me to run 10 (laughs) miles with all the people I had grown to know over how many years was it? It was about, let's see. We set up a little group in 1979. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's 21, 40 years. Yeah, that's that's quite a long time. And 10 miles, three times a week. How 10 miles, miles, three times a week. That was 30, 30 miles, 10 miles, right. three times a week. Mm-hmm. And what is it like now? Uh, it's five miles, three times a week. Mm-hmm. And do you do any, I know canoeing, I wanna talk about the canoeing, but do you do any other yeah, kind of yeah. exercises? Uh, up to this year, I've uh, been a canoe racer on a uh, lake that's uh, three miles away. And uh, they refuse to let the lake be used, a county park lake, by people who might drown you know, people self-propelled sure. you know, canoes or kayaks. They even kept Roland Mullen, who was a uh, Olympic champion three times in canoe racing in the Olympics. They let him, wouldn't let him they practice let him, on it. They were worried they, about him drowning. And, 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 and <laughs> we, what we what we did was to scare the park district 
because the lawyers and their insurance people had said, don't, don't let people do that. They'll drown and they'll sue and right. you'll have to pay. Mm. But we said, we, we pay for these parks. We have a right to use them. Mm -hmm. So they finally said, okay, 2000, we'll open them up. And they did. So I was one of the first guys out there with my racing canoe. And another guy in an old canoe came up to me and says, what kind of canoe is that? And I described it. And I said, you, you want to try it? And he, he said, yeah. So we exchanged canoes and he tried it. The next day, he took his pickup truck and drove it to Western Maryland but bought the same canoe and drove it back the same day. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Uh-huh. And he became your canoeing and buddy? He became my canoeing buddy. And then we attracted another guy because we're out there plugging away. And then I said, you know, we ought to, we ought to start a group here. He, at the time, was 13 years younger than me. Mm-hmm. That was 2000, so I was, what, uh, 78? Um, yeah, he was 13 years younger. He was 65. Mm -hmm. I said, you're going to be the tapioca of this organization. <laughs> he said, what the hell is that? I said, it's a temporary acting provisional interim orchestrator of coalition activities. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's quite a handle. It's <laughs> uh -huh. a lot of pressure. <laughs> and he said, what should we call this outfit? I said, why don't we call it the EPA? <laughs> she shook his head. <laughs> That's the Elderly Paddlers Association. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So we attracted a few more. We probably got about 12 altogether. Marilyn is one of them mm -hmm. who come out on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's 7.30 in the morning before the motorboats go out there, before it's... Uh, uh, early enough to be daylight. I mean, yeah. late enough to be daylight. Right. And are you still doing that now? Yeah. You are. Well, I haven't started the season yet. Uh -huh. It's been but, too cold. But the EPA lives lives on. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, good. <laughs> and where did you, where did you meet uh, Harvey? Obviously, Harvey Lewis is our connective tissue. He introduced us. Um, I know that you guys are, are really good friends. When did you meet Harvey? I'm not sure, but it was uh, within the last four years. And uh, I was uh, very taken with him. I thought, he, this is a, a tremendous athlete and a tremendous person. Mm -hmm. And he asked me twice to speak to his uh, class, his high school class. I said, what, what are you teaching? He said, well, government and uh, operation of cities and that sort of thing. It's the high school kids. Right. I said, what I wanted to tell him, and this is about, about the diet and uh, athletic stuff, because that would be what they might be interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, and Harvey uh, asked me every year if I want to run the Flying Pig Marathon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 5K or 10K. <laughs> I'm not up to a marathon anymore mm -hmm. unless somebody were to say, well, I'll give you $30,000 for charitable purposes. Uh, and if, if they said that, I said, I would say, I will train for a year to run a marathon at this age, uh -huh. if you give me enough money to fund this or that or the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody's well, taking me up on it. I could see that happening though. Has anybody run a marathon at, at age 100? I don't think that that's ever occurred. I don't think so. I really don't think so. Yeah. I think I could because I think uh, 
the marathon. The one I, the one I, 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 I um, set the world record in was not overly stressing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. No, I think I could have gone for, further. Really, I would imagine somebody could put together some funds that would go to charity to see you train and do a marathon. Well, it would if compromise. It. I would have to make a major sacrifice in lifestyle, I mm. think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. It might be possible, or maybe I'd find it wasn't possible for me to do that, but mm -hmm. I would only do that in, in, uh, if, if I, my training told me that I could. Right. But you're doing, like, so recently you've done 5Ks with Harvey. So you're still doing races, just not marathons. He runs at my speed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's an amazing human being, that Harvey. So did you go and talk to the students? What did you tell them? I told him about global warming and uh, sustainability of the world on this planet. And the reason I did that as I thought through introducing as best I can the impact of diet, which translates to agriculture in general, not completely because we have to grow cotton and we have to grow trees. And that agriculture at the time it was supposed to be contributing agriculture in quotation marks, supposed to be contributing 51% of the CO2, the excess that we have uh, in the atmosphere. 41%, not 51%. Mm. And we have to reduce that. Uh, and uh, somebody who understands it can help inform the public and make get the politics in such a way as to do that mm -hmm. we have not been very effective doing that no we haven't we should have been much much more effective by talking to you so that other people can hear is an important move from me in my small way and us we have a little shall we call it a think tank of four people at home mm -hmm. who meet once a month trying to get this word out. And we've done our own study of the uh, effect of food alone in agriculture of the total CO2 equivalent, which right. includes some methane, some NO2, or NO, I mean, mm -hmm. and water vapor to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Those are the greenhouse gases. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so so climate change, sustainability, the impact of agriculture on climate change, and also the ability to <clears throat> be part of the solution by getting people to change their diet. This is something that is important to you. You've been advocating for this for a long time. And I know that you've put a lot of time and, and energy and resources into restoring and improving Ohio's rivers and streams, right? You've been active in the restoration of, of, of the waterways in Ohio over the years. Well, that was before the uh, global warming issue. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I guess I, I was a canoe racer. I've been a canoe racer 60 years. Right. I know how to run a canoe. In the early days, uh, we worried about where we paddled and where it was degraded or there were dams in the way or um, all sorts of nasty things being done to the waters of the country. And they passed in 1968 the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Act as a national thing. And the Little Miami River, which goes through Cincinnati, was one of the first 27 rivers in the whole country designated to become a candidate 
to be a member of the National Wilds and Scenic River System. And uh, so that gave, uh, put a focus on the Little Miami River, which is a beautiful river, mm-hmm. and where I used to practice before I practiced on the lake. I was pretty far away, and the reason I gave it up for the lake is because it, it was not convenient. Mm-hmm. But I used to practice on that. The uh, state of Ohio had a friendly governor who happened at the time to be a, uh, a Democrat, and his name was John Gilligan. And uh, he was sympathetic to what we wanted to do. We wanted to protect Ohio's rivers. As a matter of fact, we had set up an Ohio River, uh, Ohio Scenic River system a year before the federal government did. So uh, the idea, or at least the idea that we had was that the, the people who really cared about their rivers should be members of a board of a statewide river protection group. And that's what we started with. And we were able, through that means, to gather larger numbers of people mm-hmm. together, get decisions made to protect these rivers. And interestingly, to me anyway, we decided that the American people have a way of expressing their interest in things as measured in dollars. And I think we're internationally known for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we, yeah. We decided that the Little Miami River was bringing unbelievable returns to the villages along it, economic returns to the canoe liveries, from the fishing, from the swimming, from the property value appreciation of having this beautiful stream go by that the little children could play in. And we decided it was bringing in to the public $100,000 a year, every year, reliably, as well as employing these kids who could hustle canoes and mm-hmm. liveries. <laughs> that would be a hard job to replace. And uh, that meant... Uh, $10 million a year for the 100 miles of that stream. Mm-hmm. 100 miles of the Little Miami River would bring in $10 million a year without, just because it was there. Sure. So rather than appealing to somebody's uh, sensitivity to environmental issues by focusing on the economic impact and appealing to the incentives of, of that to keep the rivers clean, that's what moves the needle. That's what actually... Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we had a governor whose name was Bob Taft, who was the son of, or grandson of William Howard Taft, mm. of great national fame. Sure. And I went to school with uh, two Taft guys, They're both gone now. And uh, Taft's uh, wife, Hope, and he bought a place on the Little Miami River to retire in after he was retired by the voters years ago. Mm -hmm. And she got really excited about water quality and the Little Miami River, the upper 43 miles of it, it's 100 miles total. And they live in the upper 43. And with the Taft money and all, there was no trouble to get Ohio State University, which I had worked with for 12 years to understand the economics of the Little Miami River. Mm-hmm. And she got the guy who was handed the job after the professor I worked with Retired in 2008. Brent Sonson, his name is. 
And they came out with a super, super economic study, which is very simple. I haven't really had a chance to study it yet. They were bringing in something like $233,000 a year, year after year, instead of $100,000 per mile, mm -hmm. per mile mm -hmm. of river. Just e economic value. Right, so the, the numbers bore it out that it's in everyone's interest to keep this river clean, and that advocacy led to that level of preservation. Yeah, that's beautiful. People spend money on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, the first yeah, yeah, time yeah. We, we, we put somebody, it's got a trail along it, and lots of people use that trail, and it goes through different counties and everything. And uh, they can estimate how much you put a guy on a trail, excuse me, you want to take a survey, and see how you like the river, how much you spend. You spend on gas, you spend on a motel, you spend on a bicycle, mm -hmm. you spend on skates, sure. you spend on clothes, you spend on food. <laughs> how much do you spend a day? <laughs> we figured out that they spend about $20 a day per person. Uh huh. And uh, I don't know how that's changed. I haven't read this new study. Yet. It just came out. Right. But uh, it, it, it's going to be a national prize winner of, a, of an analysis of how much rivers are really worth right. in dollars. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's super so I'm interesting. So proud, really proud of that because yeah. we started that thing. Mm. When you reflect back on your, on your life, what is it? that you, like the wisdom that you accrue uh, as somebody who's been alive for a long time, like what, what is the message that you would like to impart to younger people about what is important and what isn't? Well, the conclusion I came to long, long ago was the real satisfactions that people can get in their lifetimes and that they consist in helping other people, period, mm -hmm. in whatever way, as much as you can. That brings real rewards. Yeah. Service. And uh, yes, we're all servants, so we should be. It brings the pleasures. It's not the money. Mm -hmm. If you got money and you're happy, good luck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and so your service comes in the form of of your environmental work, this uh, focus on climate change. What would be another example of how you channel that service for others that has given your life meaning? Uh, well, I think this is my profession, as it were. What time I can spare, and it's a lot. I read, uh, it's a list of books I brought here today. Uh, I'm desperate to read these things. The latest one is, is advertised in the New York Times uh, Sunday review of books. And it, it talks about uh, sustainability and I need that book. I want to see it. Mm -hmm. um, and the four of us in our little th think tank want to understand that. The sustainability issue is an enormous issue because there isn't any way we can go from a population of close to 2 billion to one that is close to 8 billion in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. More than my lifetime, less than my lifetime. I think it was about 2.5 billion when I graduated from college in 1943. And now it's 8 billion. Yeah. How do you do this? And the planet's not getting any bigger. You can't farm anymore. You can't farm enough. We can't feed all the people now. It just won't work. We're finding it won't work. 
We're finding it in hunger. We're finding it in wars because people get flooded out because the temperature change is making the ground uh, unavailable to produce food. The oceans are finding it impossible to produce fish, relatively speaking, and here and there, it's totally serious. So the sustainability factor is every bit as important as the temperature, the um, mm. world uh, temperature rise. So you, you're somebody who, you're a child of the Depression. You lived through World <laughs> War II as a young person. Um, when you kind of look back on your life and reflect upon uh, your peers, I mean, we live in a society where it is about high stress. It's about accumulation of material things. But most people, by the time they reach around 80, end up in in you know uh, facilitated living centers, nursing homes, et cetera. You've been able to opt out of that. So aside from the service piece and the diet, like what are the other secrets of longevity that you've relied on that people should know more about? Exercise. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking world Not necessarily related to diet. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Exercise, being of service, diet. What about friendships, community? Absolutely. Relationships. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Call it love if you want. Well, I guess I'm succeeding at that without trying. Became a hundred, I got a box this big. Birthday cards. Wow. That's amazing. Most that people as they get older, they don't they have very few friends, but you have <laughs> lots and lots of friends. <laughs> well you find you had friends and you didn't realize it. Yeah. I even got a, a, a citation by the governor of Ohio. I didn't vote for him ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As a matter, matter of fact, the best governor we ever had married my third wife. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then he died. Okay. I don't know. I'm, I'm very, very, I realize how tremendously fortunate I happen to be. Yeah. And it's, it seems like a, it's been a simple process. No intellectual depth or uh, dangerous ventures or anything, but just grinding along and doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. And I've been very happy about it. But staying engaged with life, with other human beings, having having a sense of of purpose, right? Like your connection to climate change issues and sustainability, your love for running and canoeing and exercising. I would imagine these are big, big pieces in what you know kind of gets you excited and out of bed in the morning still. Well. We're all kind of limited in what we can do because we feel, many of us anyway, that we're under the control of the ultra-rich and corporations and we th threatened in every respect when you come to think of it and how you handle this because the corporations are the key to our uh, financial success. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I leave that for other people to work on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what is your, you know, your your message to like imagine there's a there's a lot of younger people who are listening to this. They want the wisdom of somebody who has, you know, lived a life like yours, service, friendships, purpose. You know, what else do you want to say to those people about how to live a fulfilling, meaningful, long life? Well, I think 
uh, an approach to young men and a lot of young women now is is sports, uh, and and the success of vegan athletes is tremendous. Sure, the whole whole magazines are devoted to it several times a year, and I see it. It never used to be that way, and you get kidded for eating special and, and, and who do you think you are and uh -huh. <laughs> all that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, th that's why I had some fun talking to Harvey's class. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Harvey's such a great ambassador of that as well. So yes, I imagine is. his students already know that he's a plant-based athlete. They know that he runs these crazy races, but probably receptive to what you had to say. I went... Uh, shopping with him at the Whole Foods Market in Cincinnati when he was getting supplies for his uh, uh, Appalachian Trail. Oh, Appalachian Trail. Uh -huh. uh, race. And his father would carry it in, in their van and cook for him when he came in and he'd sleep in there and then he'd go off the next day and his father and me. <laughs> yeah. Hundreds of miles away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 49 days to go 2,000 plus miles. Yeah. The, the mere fact that a, a human can do that says that they understood the principles of feeding and resting and uh, limits to your output as well. And he's got it figured out. And he's, mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful. Have you uh, have you heard of the uh, the term blue zones? The blue zones people, pockets of populations around oh, the yeah. world where okay, people live the longest. Back. Uh -huh. Yeah, centenarians, and they studied these populations and they extracted from that certain tenets or principles of lifestyle that all of these communities shared. Um, among them are diets that are predominantly plant-based. They aren't exclusively plant-based, but most of these populations where, where they have the highest concentration of people living to 100 and beyond are eating right. mostly a plant-based diet. But they also are, are populations where they're moving all the time. They're not going to the gym or running marathons, but they have- Seasonal. Yeah, movement-oriented lifestyles. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they have rich, um, rich relationships within the community. So they have uh -huh. support and they have connection. They're also tend to be relatively faith-based in different ways, like faith is a big piece of it. And this idea of purpose, like what in Okinawa they call ikigai, like feeling like you have a reason for your, for your living. And, and what I see in you is an example of all of those principles in, it, it, in your it life. It is admirable what they do. I haven't uh, been exposed to it. I know that they do exist. I, I mm -hmm. read a little bit about them, but I, there's always some limit to what they can do because of this or that or the other thing, but they do live longer. They are happy people. And uh, maybe there are a lot of ideas that they have that we could use if we are smart enough to do, to do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the fact that you didn't even kick into your highest gear in running until you were around 60, and that's when you kind of really found your competitive groove with all of this, like it's very inspiring because that's a period of time where most people would feel like it's time to slow down. And in, in, in your example, that's where I feel like you really started to get more engaged with your life. I think there's, I was in business long enough to understand that there's a competition that's normal to business in the United States and other countries. And so there's a spirit of competition. That's the way you get things done. And uh, it's not totally uh, compatible with uh, the lifestyle you would advocate, you might say. Mm -hmm. uh, 
That's something I ought to know more about. <laughs> yeah. But you said that now you feel like you're having the best time of your life. <laughs> yes? Well, we had, we had a birthday party on the beach in Florida. I saw the video. There's a video on the internet of that, of your and, birthday party. Uh, I have a, a nephew who was the mayor of uh, Vero Beach, which is where we have relatives and where we... <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and he called up somebody who used to be manager of the local newspaper, the Vero Beach Press Journal, and he came out on the beach to see me on my uh -huh. birthday and took all the stuff down. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I published it the next day. And I, Marilyn and I went around and fetched 10 copies of the newspaper so yeah. we could send it to our families. <laughs> and you're here in Los Angeles. You have children, grandchildren, and a great-granddaughter here yeah. that you have yet to meet because of the pandemic. Is, is that right? I, I, I haven't met her because it's been questionable whether one should fly. Right. Well, you're here, so you're going to have a big family reunion? <laughs> yeah, we mm -hmm. will. We will. So that's uh, Marilyn's sister lives in uh, Lake Arrowhead up the hill in San Bernardino. Sure. And she's going to see us this afternoon. <laughs> Good. Um, well, I want to um, kind of end this on uh, on a, a note of of inspiration. Like again, going back to looking over the course of your life, you've lived through so many periods of of American history, and you know now we're, as you mentioned, tipping into eight billion people on the planet. Like when you reflect back over the course of your life. Like, how do you feel about the future of America and the future of, of the planet going forward? Well, either we face a period of really tremendous suffering, massive suffering, or we get smart enough to do some important laws and work on them and understand them so that we can continue to manage this little bitty planet. We can't, you can talk about going to Mars. I don't know anybody would be willing to do that. Mm. Who's going to write the newspaper? <laughs> 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 Who's going to run the grocery store? Just one of, you know. In Mars? <laughs> well, we'll, we'll see. We'll Venus. see. But yeah, sure. <laughs> let's let's save our planet in the meantime rather than abandon it for another, of course. Well, I don't know. There may be one out there out of the billions or trillions of planets that there are. <laughs> right. The fact that you have thrived on a, on a plant-based diet over these years you're an incredible example of the health and robustness of eating this way and the fact that you've set these world records eating this way. You're an early pioneer of this lifestyle. I know that you've, you're friends with a lot of the, the legendary doctors in the space, Neil Bernard and Colin Campbell and Caldwell Esselstyn. Um, and I just, I salute you for being an ambassador and, uh, and, and like a, a such a, a youthful energy uh, exemplar of eating a plant-based diet and being this incredible athlete along the way. And I really do think that you, maybe, you, maybe we should try to see if you can get that marathon in. It's a wonderful thing. It's, it's a quality of life issue, as yeah. a matter of fact. Yeah, if yeah. people are nice to you when you get old. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to speak to somebody who, who, has, uh, who, has a, who has been around for a while and has wisdom to impart. So, well, yeah, I have I've been there. I've been through this and I've been through that. And uh, I'm fortunate, very fortunate that I survived. My father died of liver cancer, and he had six months of terrible pain. And he, he'd been an athlete. He'd been a gymnast when he was in college. Mm. 
not, diet was standard American. Yeah. But liver cancer, I'm sure, was caused by diet. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. sure of it. Right. And today we would have fixed him up. Yeah. But he, he died at the age of 69. And uh, my mother died of a heart attack, which was standard. Right. You sort of expect it when they're in their 70s. Could have probably prevented that if I'd known then what I know now. Sure. But your your blood work is good. You're healthy. You're going to be around for a while. I hope so. Everything's good. You get you get you you go to the doctor. You get your checkups. Everything is a okay. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they called me and asked me to come in to have a, a regular test, and I did, and I passed it with flying colors. You did. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Are the doctors surprised when you come in? Uh, or they know you now, like this is just my Well, it's, it's only one or two and when you come right down to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, they, they have to accept it because I can challenge them right. too, too easily. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, Any, anyway. thank you for coming to talk to me today. You are you are an inspiration, and uh, it it is amazing the fact that that you change your diet at seventy. This, this is you know. probably no question. It's actually the high point of what you may call my career oh. to be interviewed by you, who has interviewed. I got your volume too. It's a gorgeous thing. Oh, you did good, good. It weighs about twenty pounds. <laughs> <laughs> you could it's do curls gorgeous. with it. Where do you get this photography like that? All of these people that look so inspiring. <laughs> That's not my department. <laughs> no, I think I think what you what you're doing is incredibly inspiring, and your example, I think, is very uplifting to everybody who would hear this or see this, who's thinking about their future and what that might look like as, as we all get older. And, you know, again, I've said it many times over the course of our conversation, but the fact that you have remained so uh, not only active, um, but, but really intentional in how you're living your life is I think a, a real inspiration to all of us. And so I guess just in closing, if there's any kind of final thoughts or, or, or wisdom that, that you would like to impart to anybody who's listening to this? Well, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. My gang of four will be very pleased that I was able to express myself on this and that subject that we work on once a month normally. And that's a major impact I could have is to reach other people with this message because I'm saying it works for me, mm -hmm. big time, to be at least 22 years older than the average person who dies in America. And I feel that's not long enough yet. <laughs> yeah, I think you got a lot of life left in you, Mike. Yeah, so. You're always welcome here, and I look forward to hanging out with you for a little bit after we're, we're done here. And um, I just appreciate you, sir. So thank you. And keep doing what you're doing. I think it's important and powerful, like I said. And just to be an, a thriving example of a plant-based diet, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Right back at you, my friend. Yeah.